All right. <laughs> um, now, face cells are neurons that respond more to faces than to other objects. And the face cells that I'm going to talk about are the ones found in these face patches in the macaque ventral stream in inferior temporal cortex. And the question that I will be addressing is how face specific the mechanisms are behind face cell responses. And this question can refer to what a face cell encodes about uh, a stimulus, but it can also refer to uh, how that information can be used downstream. And I think ultimately face selectivity is a statement about what is decodable. But of course that face selectivity is the result of the first part, which is what makes a face cell respond. And that's the part of the question that I'm going to uh, talk about today. So in answering that question, most previous studies and models have focused on face specific information, such as face parts, their configuration, and even semantic information. However, there's one potential problem with this idea, and that is if face cells only respond to face specific properties, what explains their responses to non face objects, which don't have any face parts, right? So we believe that the answer is that face cells are part of a domain general uh, representation and that they encode visual properties that are applicable across domain boundaries. So in this framework, um, face cells could be considered directions in a high dimensional shape or texture space on which faces tend to project higher, so hence the face selectivity. But other than the direction, there is nothing fundamentally different um, from other neurons. This also means that non-face images vary along the same attributes that, um, that determine face selectivity. And so a consequence of that is that this implies that non-face responses should be informative about how face selective a neuron is. So to investigate this, um, we focused on non-face responses. And so we turned the question, what makes a face cell respond to faces into what makes a face cell respond to non-faces. So to answer that question, I analyzed recordings um, from macaque face areas in response to hundreds of face and non-face stimuli. So we have like here all the stimuli that we used and about two thirds of them were non-faces. That's 960 and then 400 and something faces. And this is an important departure from previous studies which focused mainly on faces to characterize face cells, right? The preferred stimulus. So to give an overview of the data, here's a heat map of the matrix of responses where um, the color scale indicates response strength. The rows are different neural sites or units that we recorded from. And the columns here are stimuli with first the faces and then the non-faces. And as you can see from the average here below, the response on average for faces is higher than for non-faces. Um, and one of the first things we did is see if this non-face response structure is even reliable, right? Because there's not a lot of response strength there compared to the faces. So in fact, what we found is that at the image level, at least, um, non-face information was at least as reliable as face information. So here, each dot is a neural site and uh, the ones in blue are the neural sites that had a higher image level reliability for non-faces compared to uh, faces and vice versa for the orange neural sites. Um, and even for the neural sites that responded most to faces here on the bottom, you still see on average that there's about as many neural sites which have a higher reliability for non-faces as there are neural sites that have a higher reliability for faces. So given this reliable response structure that we have here, um, what we did is next to see how predictive this response structure is of, of face selectivity. So first we quantified face selectivity for each of these neural sites using a metric called phase D prime. Um, and, and this basically quantifies how separable faces and non-faces are based on the responses. And positive values mean that uh, the neural site uh, responds more to faces than to non-faces. So now the question is, can we predict face selectivity or, or quantified as D prime from just looking at this response structure for non-faces? And so here, to, to, to illustrate this a little bit, here are two neural sites. Uh, one has a lower face selectivity than the other. And what we did is we normalized these responses um, 
to the mean and the standard deviation of non-phases only. And then we use these responses to non-phases and only looked at them and tried to predict the prime from them, like how much higher is the response to a phase going to be. The results show that we could indeed predict the graded range of phase selectivity um, uh, that we observed um, from just looking at with a linear regression model from just looking at this response structure for non-phases that was normalized. So we're not looking at the average difference in responses, but just at, at like the, the pattern of responses across images. Um, and in fact, non-phase responses were more informative about phase selectivity than phase responses. So if we try to do the same thing by just looking at phases, we couldn't do as well. And that's even the case if we equalize the number of images. So what explains this link between the response structure for non-phase objects and phase selectivity. We found that tuning to color and, and simple shape properties didn't predict phase selectivity. First, we saw that phase selective neural sites tended to respond more strongly to rounder um, or less elongated and more tan or more reddish objects. And when we quantified these intuitive properties, um, we confirmed that this relation to phase cell responses but overall neural tuning to these properties was not predictive of phase selectivity. So if not these intuitive properties, what about more complex image attributes? And now we're gonna to turn to what everybody turns to these days, uh, which are deep neural networks trained on object recognition. Um, and so these computer models can achieve object classification by learning to extract complex image statistics. And we use these image statistics to fit encoding models for each of the neural site using just the, response, uh, the responses for non-phase objects, right? So we're kind of trying to characterize each neural site in terms of what makes it respond to non-phases. And we found that these non-phase encoding models could also predict phase selectivity of the actual neural site. So the encoding axis estimated um, from non-phase responses was as phase selective on average as the original neuron. And the extent to which we can, uh, to, to which this worked, to which a non-phase encoding model could predict phase selectivity, depended on the type of images that the deep net was trained in. So this worked best for an image that trained in a network, even better than uh, for, for a network trained on, um, on phase classification. So basically the tuning for these rich statistical features that are optimized for general object classification could best capture phase selectivity from the response structure of non-phase images. And so one potential inf interpretation is that phase cells encode how much an image or a phase image, uh, sorry, or non-phase image looks like a phase. And that, that's why we can predict phase selectivity, right? So maybe it's just responding to how much an apple looks like a phase. And that's when we look at that, that that's why you can extrapolate and predict phase selectivity. So we believe that the data show pretty strongly that this is not the case. And basically that's because even in the most phase selective sites, we could find non-phase images that had a stronger response than images that are clearly phases. So let me show you. Um, these are the preferred non-phase images of the 117 most phase-selective neural sites. So each image here uh, represents one neural site. And here are images per neural site, which had a lower response. But these on the left are clearly phases, and these on the right are clearly not, right? And so this rejects the notion that the reason why phase cells respond to non-phases or that the reason why phase cells respond to non-phases is the degree to which a non-phase looks like a phase. Um, and these images are not just outliers because it could just be like, okay, neural responses are noises, noisy, maybe these are just outliers. Um, and that's not the case because when we did statistical tests, even using a Bonferroni correction, correcting for over 400,000 comparisons that we did between each of the pairwise images, um, we found that 68% of the neural sites uh, survived this uh, very conservative test. And so finally, we also discovered that these non-phase encoding models make some striking predictions about the phase inversion effect or generally about an inversion effect. First, for phases, we found that the non-phase encoding model predicted the well-known phase inversion effect, right? Which means that 
you have a higher response, the face selected neural site will, will respond higher to an upright face compared to an inverted face. And our non face encoding mode would predict that. But we can also use these models to make predictions about preferred orientation of non face images. So, what we did is like we used the model to pick images that for which the upright orientation was preferred and for which the inverted orientation was preferred. And then, surprisingly, later neural recordings um, with independent neural sites confirmed that this model predicted orientation preference was indeed uh, true for real neurons as well. So this shows that the orientation preference of face cells is not restricted to faces. So that's where I'll conclude my talk today. So what I've shown you is that the response structure for non-phase images is, is reliable. And it's not just reliable, it's actually predictive of phase selectivity. And this link was not explained by like simple intuitive properties um, that we could think of, but it was explained by, by the more complex image statistics that are encoded in deep neural networks. And these image statistics quantify characteristics that are face selective, but they don't quantify faceness. And so in terms of what is encoded, the core network of face patches does not appear to be face specific in the sense that it only responds to uh, attributes that are applicable to faces. And I think this is consistent with previous work suggesting that macaque IT cortex is best understood as a domain general map of object uh, representations. And so what is the implication of this domain general coding framework where neurons represent objects across domain boundaries? In this framework, faces are still face selective, but they also show a rich and graded range of responses that is not sufficiently captured when we focus only on faces. So indeed, I've shown you that uh, we could predict face selectivity better from non-face responses than face responses. And I think what this means is that when we focus on a specific subset of stimuli, we may achieve a level of understanding that is a reasonable approximation on the surface, but ultimately we cannot claim to understand the neural code if our understanding does not reach beyond the boundaries of uh, the preferred stimulus class. And so finally, if you're wondering now uh, how this might tie into the illusory, illusory perception of faces in objects, make sure to visit Saloni's poster uh, tomorrow morning. Um, yeah, and I'll conclude my talk. Thank you. Gorgeous talk. Thank you. We were wait, waiting for analysis like that for years. But I have two questions. Uh, existence of information and the fact that that information is used to different things. Is there any indication that the information is used for decision making by the subject? And the second question is, is there any difference between uh, non-face encoding within face selective areas versus non-face encoding outside face selective areas? Is there anything special here about non-faces? Thank you. Um, so the first part is, uh, and I, I, I try to uh, address this in the beginning, um, I think these are two separate questions, right? Like what, what, what determines our responses and what are they used for later on, right? And that, that part of the question I'm not addressing. There, there's other great work that, that, that tried to do that uh, by, by inactivating these areas. Uh, but again, the focus there was heavily on uh, how does it affect face images? So there's some non-face controls, but they're just picked. And I think what this work also suggests is that if you wanna test the face specificity there, you need to pick images that, you know, that our work suggests that they'll have a high response in these face areas. Um, I forgot the second part of the question. <laughs> uh, so the second part was that, you know, is there any difference between non-face encoding within face selective area versus yeah. non-face encoding outside face selective area? Um, some of our neural sites were not in, in, in face selective areas. Um, but yeah, I, I, I do not have exactly that information, uh, which ones for, for, we couldn't find any consistent difference that, uh, amongst different neural sites. That, that's all I can say to that, yeah. Um, right, can I ask a question or is it too late? Yeah. One more quick question. Yeah. Uh, Great, uh, great talk, thanks. Thank I was wondering whether the greater predictive power of non-faced objects would be driven just by 
because they sample a wider space of visual features, whereas faces are pretty constrained. And so maybe they have less predictive power if you use them. I might, might have missed this. At the beginning of the talk, I came late, sorry. Yeah, so I think the answer is that we have, like, we're indeed like uh, covering a broader range of, of, of what, did, what, what causes this graded responses that, that we see for uh, images in general. And that, that's why we can better characterize it. Um, uh, but I think that's also consistent with our idea of uh, domain general uh, space. So. Sure.